Hello all, we're going to start lesson six with looking at measures of central tendency. Um, measures of central tendency uh, are things such as the mean, the median, and the mode. So we're going to do a real quick review of what those are. You've probably heard those terms at some point, but so the mean is just what we call the arithmetic average. So you sum up all the data points, and then you divide by the number of data points. When you first learn this, usually this is what they call the average, but actually mean, median, and mode are all considered averages. So more technically correct is to call this a mean. Um, I usually joke with students that, the uh, you know, why did we change the name from the average to the mean? And it's because we're mean math teachers and we like to confuse you, so we changed the name. Um, that's not really the reason, and I didn't change the name, but if it helps you remember what it is, that's great. So we're going to sum up all the data and divide if we want to find the mean. The median is the center of the data. So if we took the data points, say there's, you know, 20 data points, and we put 10 on one side and 10 on the other, and we looked right what was in the middle of those, that would be the median. <clears throat> For the uh, mode, that is the one that occurs the most often. Now, for mean and median, there's only one number, but sometimes for mode, um, there's more than one number that occurs the most. So you could have, and there's, sometimes there's no number that occurs more than the others. So mean, mean and median are, are one number always, but mode can be no numbers or it could be more than one number. So which bin contains the median, oh, I'm sorry, let's start with the first question. How many individuals are included in the sample? So when we look at this, this is a sample of credit card debt. This is credit card balance in dollars, and this is the frequency or how often it happens. So when we look here and it says 0 to 2,500, first of all, remember the way that, that our materials do it. This 2,500 would actually be in this bin. So this, this bin is 0 up to but not including 2,500. This bin would be 2,500 up to but not including 5,000. So, you know, all the way up to $4,999.99 um, and so on. So how many are in here? Well, we see here that this bin has two people in it. There's two people that have 0 to 2,500. Here, there's another two people that have 2,500 to 5,000. This goes up to four. So there's four people in this bin. That's why this bin is taller. There's five people in this bin. That's why this bin is yet taller again. This bin has four, and this bin has three. So there's three people that they sampled that have between 12,500 and 15,000 um, dollars in credit card debt, four that have 10,000 to 12,500, five that have 7,500 to 10,000, and so on. So if we add those all up, what do we get for a total? That would be the total number of individuals that are in the sample. So we have two, that's four, eight, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 19, 20 people that are in this sample. And now it asks, which bin contains the median credit card balance? Now, we're talking about a bin here. We're not talking about a single value. Very uh, easy or very tempting for people to say, well, the median is the, is the center of the data, so the median is 7,500. But that's not true. That's not how we calculate median. Median, remember, we're supposed to be splitting the um, the balance, not the balance, but the number of people in half. So if we have 20 people, we're trying to figure out where we would split this so we have 10 on one side and 10 on another side. And so I'm going to do something that seems to have helped some students in the past. I'm going to make a tick mark for everybody. So there's the two people that are in that bin. There's the two people that are in that bin. There's four people in this bin. Five in here. four in this bin, and then three in this bin. So if I had to cut that in half, 
where would the middle of that be? In other words, where would I have 10 on one side and 10 on the other side? So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then 9, 10 is in here. So I'd need 2 to be on the, the lower side and the other 3 to be on the upper side. So it would be like right in here. And that way we have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 on that side. And then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 on this side. Let me back that up just a minute and I will make that one so it doesn't have the cross through it so we can see it better. So instead of doing the typical tick marks, I'll just do five marks here. And then the four here. And then the three here. So then when we split the data um, in half, um, again, we want 10 and 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And the middle would be here. That would be the median. So the median is in the bin 7,500 to 10,000. So I'll write that here, put the answer up here. And again, don't forget that somebody who actually had 10,000 would be in this bin, actually. So this bin goes from 7,500 up to 10,000, but not including 10,000. So now it says create a data set that matches the histogram. In other words, record a set of dollar amounts so that we get two that are in this bin, two that are in this bin, and so on. So we're going to try to kind of backtrack. We don't have the actual data values because it's been um, organized and compiled into this histogram. But could we make a data set that fit this histogram? And the answer is yes. And what values do we use? It's up to you. I can pick any two values that are in this range because I don't know what they actually were. So I'm going to just make up values that fit the data set. So I'm going to try to squeeze it in over here so that we can see it along with the data set. So we've got, um, you know, if we were in here, maybe one of those people has $1,000 of debt. Maybe another person has $2,000 worth of debt. But 1,000 and 2,000 will both go in this bin, so now I have two data values that are in that bin. Okay. Again, I'm just making these up. Different people could pick different things. Um, here, say I have somebody who has 3,000 and another person that has 4,000. 3,000 and 4,000 will both go in here. This bin, um, I'm going to pick somebody who has uh, 5,500. So 5,500 would be in this bin. Um, say we have 6,000, uh, 6,500, and 7,000. So now this would have been the first bin. This would have been the second bin. And now I have 5,500 up to 7,000. So that would all be in this bin. I have four of them. Two, three, four. And then the next bin right here, I'm going to have um, five values that are in here. Now, something that's interesting to note, they don't have to all be different. Um, you know, I could in here, I could say I have somebody who has 8,000. And I have another person that has 8,000. These don't all have, all five people don't have to have a different amount of debt. Um, then I could do a 9,000, maybe another 9,000 to keep things simple. And then um, maybe a 9,500. Then in this bin, and that's the end of that bin. So this bin was split between the two columns here and here. And then this bin, I need four people that would be in that range. So maybe somebody that has 10,500. Another person that has 11,000. Um, another person that has 11,500. And another person that has 12,000. You can repeat values if you want to. And then up here, um, I'm going to have somebody who has, we need three people. So let's have two people that have 13,000. And another person that has 14,000. And so now I, this data set, if this had been our original data set, which we, again, don't know that it is, but if this had been our original data set, it would have graphed as this histogram. 
So now that we have this uh, data set that fits the histogram, it says um, they want us to mark the mean and the median of our data set. So where would the mean, let's do the median first because it's easier. The median of our data set would be 10 on each side, and I purposely put 10 on each side. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So these are already in order. I already have 10 on this side and 10 on this side. So the median would be right in between the 8,000 and the 9,000. So what do I do with that? Do I say it's 8,000? Do I say it's 9,000? And the answer is I actually average those. So if the average, if the median is right here, then the median would be right in between those, and it would be um, 8,500. So I didn't actually have an 8,500, but between the 8,000 and the 9,000, the average between those two, or right in the middle of those two, is 8,500. So that's the median. Now for the mean, remember, for mean, we have to sum up all the data and then divide by the number of data. So I'm going to add up all these numbers. I'll do that. Uh, I'll stop the recording for a minute, add up all these numbers. But I add up all these numbers, and I'm going to divide by 20 because there's 20 in the data set. Okay, so now for median, I've gone through and I've added up all of these numbers. And in adding them up, I got uh, 163,500. And then if I divide that by how many there are, which is 20, I'll get the arithmetic uh, average or the mean of these numbers. So 163,500 divided by 20 um, gets me 8,175. And it's exactly, not rounded or anything. So $8,175 is the mean of this data set that we made up. Um, now it says to mark the mean and the median on the horizontal axis. So the horizontal axis would be if the axis is going side to side. And so our median is, I'm going to use a different color and label it in. Okay, so our median is at 8,500, which would be, again, kind of close to right in here. And this would be our median. And then the mean is barely big or barely smaller than that. It's 8175. So our since this is uh, kind of symmetric, it's fairly evenly distributed. Our mean and our median didn't come out too much different from each other. So our mean is below this, but not by much. Um, so our mean is here. All right, so uh, I kind of gave this next question away because now it says, which phrase best describes the median of your data set? Is the median significantly less than the mean? No, our median is actually a little higher. Is it roughly the same as the mean or is it significantly greater? Well, it is greater than the mean, but I wouldn't call this significantly greater. We're only, um, you know, $225 off of the median. And we're talking thousands of dollars. That's not very much. So in answer to this question, I'm going to choose uh, they're roughly the same. Keep that a little bit bigger so we can see it. So the mean and the median are roughly the same for this data set. So now we're going to look at another histogram. And in this histogram, again, we have sample of credit card debt. Um, we have our credit card balance here and our frequency. Um, I'm going to look at how many people are in this data set. Again, we can assume it's 20. That's probably not a good thing to assume that. So let's go ahead and, and count how many are in each category. So in this category, there's 14. In this category, there's 2. And in each of these categories, there's only 1. So there's a little 1 in here. So if I add that up, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So again, there are, there are 20 uh, people in this sample. And it asks us, or it tells us that the median for this sample is zero. What does that mean? Um, how can you have a median of zero? Well, what that means is 
when you were if you were to list out all the people in this data set we want when you cut it in the middle to find the median we want it to be zero so that means that we need write it out like we had before if we put 10 people in this column and this is zero credit card debt and we want to cut this in half remember we had our our little red line for our for our median so we want to cut this in half so I want to have half on this side and half on the other side when I go to the other side of this I want there again to be a zero because I want the median to be zero so what's the average or we're halfway between zero and zero zero so at least the first 11 people in this survey have zero debt not just 10 but actually 11 because I need the average between this 10th and this 11th thing to be zero now that's 11 people we have three more people in here so say we have another person that has 500 another person that has a thousand and another person that has 1500 that's okay that still makes the median at zero then I have two people in here so that's the end of the first bin um, I have somebody say somebody that has 3,000 and somebody else that has 4,000 um, I have one person in here say they have 6,000 this is the bin of two this is a bin of one then I have uh, somebody in there so say they have 9,000 and then I have two more like that so somebody in here we'll say 11,500 and somebody up here say they're at 14,000 again I'm just picking those numbers as long as they're within that bin I'm okay but again if I count these there's 10 people over here there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten people over here so the median would be between this zero and that zero and ha um, and be zero for the median so now they're going to up the ante on us a little bit and it says here that they want the mean for this sample to be 2600 and we're supposed to create a data set with a median of zero which we already did but a mean of 2600 that matches the histogram so our data set here that um, averages we don't know what the average is yet I haven't added these up but we want this to average 2600 so remember how do you get an average well we want to sum them all up and then in this case we want to divide by 20 and when we're done we want the average to be 2600 so does that work right now well let me add these up so when I take what I have here and I add it up I get 50,500 for my total now is 50,500 divided by 20 give me the 2600 that I want and the answer is no it doesn't um, when I divide that I actually get 2525 not too far off but still not quite the average we want so do we want to just you know shoot around in the dark here and switch things around and the answer is no because we could guess for a long time before we could come up with what we want so let's be a little bit more mathematical about it if I want to have a sum that when I divide it by 20 I get 2600 what do I want that sum to be well if I take since I'm going to divide to get 2600 if I do the reverse operation if I multiply these and I take 2600 times 20 that'll give me the total that I need so I need a sum of 52,000 in order to get 2,600. Again, that's from 2,600 times 20. So 2,600 times 20, I need a total of 52,000 so that when I divide it by 20, I get 2,600. So I'm a little bit short here. I'm 1,500 short. So I need to come back here and add 1,500 to this without... Um, moving the values out of their bins 
So um, let's go back to this value, and instead of making it a thousand, let's say this person has uh, 1500. Now that's still within the bin, and so I'm still okay with uh, fitting what the histogram looks like. And now I'm 500 closer to um, that 52,000 mark that I want. So I added I added 500 to that one. Um, let's add 500 to this one. I think I can kind of sneak this one in here. So say that's 3,500 instead of 3,000. Again, that's still within this bin of 2,500 to 5,000, um, but it adds an extra 500 for us. Okay, so we've added 500 twice, and we needed 1,500, so we need to add another one. Um, maybe here we could add, again, make this 6,500 instead of 6,000. And I could have done that differently. I could have just changed this to... Um, to 7,000, and then I would have ha only had to add 500. But the idea is somewhere in here I wanted to add 1,500. I chose to add 500 three, t three different times. But if I add these up now, I should get 52,000. So when you're aiming for this um, specific average, the key is you have to figure out what's this total that I need in order to get that after I divide it. So I needed 52,000 so that when I divided it by 20, I got 2,600. So I played around with my numbers until I got a total of 52,000. So now my total is not 50,500 anymore. My total is 52,000. And when I divide that by 20, I get my 2,600 for my mean. So it says... Um, this is a really bad joke. I don't know why this is in here, but it says for convenience name the four individuals in your data set who have credit card balances in the top four bins as the spenders and the other individuals as the savers. Okay, so we'll call, get a different color here, these four people they're calling the spenders. And um, the other people from here back are called the savers. And so it says the savers are all at a party having a good time. So that's all these people zero, that have zero, 500, up to 4,000. Um, when the spenders arrive, the, sun, the savers suddenly get depressed. The spenders say, hey, why is everybody so glum? And the savers reply, don't you know what you four guys just did to our average credit card debt? So what is the the purpose of that punchline? Well, if we go back and remember that all of these people together had an average of 2,600, if we leave these people out and we just count the savers, the people that were at the party before the spenders got there, if we total up their debt, we only have, what is that, 2,000, uh, 3,500, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, we have 11,000 total. So if I was going to take um, the savers and compute their average, then I only get a average of 11,000. I can't divide by 20 again because I don't have 20 people. I've dropped these people out, so I only have 16 people. But even at that, for the savers, then we get... 11,000 divided by 16 is only an average of $687.50. And so by these four people arriving at the party, the average at the party for the credit card debt went from $687.50 all the way up to $2,600. So these four people are having a huge effect on the average because their credit card debt is so much higher than the rest of the people. So now I'm going to spend just a little bit of time um, looking at this lesson six part B that's on um, brain power. Uh, this is part of the student success things that we talk about uh, in this course. And um, the question here, it says, many people believe that if you do not have a math brain, you cannot learn math, and if you have a math brain, that learning math is easy. What do you think about that statement? Well, um, 
one thing I want to point out is if you have, think of something that, that maybe comes easy to you or easier to you than other people. Maybe you're good at a sport. Maybe you're good at um, being a parent. Maybe you're good at um, budgeting. Maybe you're good at English. Maybe you're good at learning foreign languages. Maybe you're good at interacting with people and, and uh, keeping uh, people from, uh, keeping people in harmony. Um, you know, you're that one friend that, you know, everybody kind of turns to to keep everybody um, from being upset with each other. Um, maybe you're a, you're good at traveling or exploring things. Maybe you're good at science. Um, out of that, that thing that you're good at, does that mean that it's always easy for you? That you never have to work at it? So if somebody said to you, oh, well, you're good at English, you know, that's your best class, um, you don't have to work at it. You know that you do work at, at the classes, even the classes that are easy for you. In an English class, uh, just because you're good at writing papers doesn't mean that um, you don't work at it. Um, just because you're good at learning a foreign language doesn't mean you haven't studied uh, flashcards trying to learn vocabulary or um, studied um, the different uh, tenses or forms of, of words within that language to learn that language. So the same thing um, is, is true with math. Um, a lot of people think if you have a math brain that math is easy. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is everything that anybody learns, whether it's a sport or academic or, uh, you know, mathematic, mathematically academic, scientifically academic, anything that we do like that, it takes work. It takes work to learn those things. And so... Um, it talks about your frameworks course here. That would be like your um, EDUC 1300 class that you've taken. It says you learned about brain plasticity, and I'm not sure whether you did or not. But um, the fact of um, the matter is, is that brains continue to grow throughout our lifetime. A lot of people think, oh, I'm graduated with high school, or I'm graduated with college, or I've got my job now. But your gr brain continues to grow throughout your entire life. You know. When you're young, you're learning how to um, do the things maybe that you're learning at school. You're learning the basics of your sport. But anybody who's an athlete um, for their entire life, they keep learning things in that sport. Anybody who um, has a job, you keep learning things at your job. You learn different things. Maybe you learn to you know, garden when you're 50. Um, maybe you learn to um, skydive when you're 35. Maybe you learn to... Uh, drive a car or speak another language, you know, when you're well into your adult years. Uh, most people don't learn how to parent until they're an adult. Um, some people uh, don't become a parent. They don't uh, learn that skill directly. doesn't mean they can't care give to children. But um, when you become a parent, then you learn a whole different set of skills. So um, the brain grows throughout your lifetime, and you should never um, try to stop learning, um, and you should never assume that you aren't going to continue learning. One thing I always like to point out to my students is a lot of people will say, well, I've never been good at math, um, which always breaks my heart when I hear people say that because, first of all, um, it means at some point they had bad experiences in math classes, and, and uh, I hate to hear that. But the other thing is, is just because when you were in 7th or 8th grade and, you know, 6th, 7th, 8th grade, somebody tried to teach you algebra, um, which is pretty common um, right now, and it didn't make sense to you, that doesn't make, mean that it won't make sense to you now. Or just because you, you learned um, or you had a hard time with, you know, again, like 8th grade math, maybe it wasn't algebra, maybe it was uh, some sort of... Um, basic math. I'll just kind of group this algebra or even or some sort of like a basic when I say basic math I don't mean easy math I mean math that doesn't involve algebra. Um, so algebra is where we have the variables and the letters in our in the mathematics. Um, so just because seventh or eighth grade you had a hard time with some class doesn't mean that now you're not going to understand the material. Our brains continue to grow and in fact one of the problems that I find with trying to teach algebra to seventh and eighth graders is some seventh and eighth graders have not in their brain development reached what they call um, abstract thinking. You can't do anything to force that. It'd be like saying if I stood my two-month-old up repeatedly that he'll learn to walk easier. 
and that's not the case. Same thing with brain development. Your brain develops in its own time, and so if you tried to learn algebra as a seventh grader and your brain wasn't ready for abstract thinking, that's going to be very difficult because algebra is abstract. We're saying this letter x equals a number 5, and if that, if your brain isn't ready to accept that, algebra is going to be really, really difficult for you. Um, that's why some people uh, don't like algebra, but then just a year later they love geometry. Um, geometry is much more concrete. It's visual, uh, it's concrete, and it's um, a very different kind of mathematics. So um, anyway, the biggest thing that I'm trying to get to here is, you know, don't think to your, don't think that just because something was hard when you were younger means it's impossible now. Uh, just because you got, you know, had a hard time in the past doesn't mean that uh, some of these things um, won't make sense this time. Maybe it's because it's presented differently. Maybe it's because you're older. Maybe it's because you're more motivated to be at school. But for whatever reason, your brain will continue to grow and learn things throughout your lifetime. So um, a kind of interesting game they have us play here. It says, which of the following two boxes contains the most dots? Now, I could sit here and count these. There's one, two, three, four in the left box and one, two, three in the right box. But when I, when you first thought of that question, did you have to count the dots in the box? And the answer is probably not. Most of us can just glance at that and we can see that there's more here than here. Our brain kind of matches up the dots and realizes that there's an extra one over here, which is kind of remarkable. Because you can do that usually fairly quickly. Not fairly quickly, usually very quickly. So now we have another set of boxes here, and it says scientists are interested in knowing if substantially different neural processes govern per perceiving differences in small quantities versus counting differences in larger quantities. So which of the following two boxes contains the most dots? So in this, can you glance at this and see which one has the most? Now, I know I can do that at least for this amount, I'm sure when it gets a little bit bigger, I'd, there'd be a point where I couldn't. But this amount, I could tell fairly quickly that this right box had more in it. So there's been studies done on how many box, how many does there have to be in the boxes if there's just a difference in one um, before the brain can't just look at it and recognize it. So if you look over here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Whereas up here, there's one, two, three, four. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this box has one more. This has 9, this has 10. So there's a point where everybody's brain, um, and it'll, it would be different points for different people, where you can't just glance at it and say this box has more than the other um, when, there's just, when they're just one apart. Um, and so finally, uh, for this little discussion, it says, do you sometimes feel that others get math the same way that you could tell the difference between the four and three dots? while you have to work at math the same way as that you had to count the difference between the 10 dots and the 9 dots. If so, you're not alone, but it may surprise you that to learn that everybody has to work at learning math. So, um, you know, I have a, a bachelor's degree in math and a master's degree in math, and I want to tell you, I spent a lot of time learning math. I didn't just walk into classes, listen to the professor, and get it right away. I had a lot of studying to do. Um, same thing with, uh, again, anything that you've uh, worked on, um, that you've learned, you've, pro you've probably done a lot of work on it. So some people may have to work harder than others, but everybody can learn that. So, and everybody can get better. Think of it as an athlete. You know, I may never be um, a Michael Phelps or a professional baseball player or something like that. But does that mean that if I swam that I wouldn't get better? Or if I pitched and, and worked at, at pitching baseballs or hitting baseballs, uh, that I wouldn't get better? Um, and the answer is, of course not. Um, the more you work at something, the better you're going to get at it, um, no matter your natural talent at it to, to start with. So in uh, part C here for lesson six, we're going to talk about making decisions. So taking a dat data that you have and making a decision from what you know. Um, and so we're going to look at these uh, three employment opportunities um, that are advertised. And this one uh, says, we have immediate need for five enthusiastic self-starters who love the outdoors and who love people. 
our salespeople make an average of 1000 per week come join the winning team so up here it asks us um, to examine the three advertisement advertisements and identify the measures of central tendency so in this case they use the term average and again when we hear the word average um, used like that they usually uh, are discussing the mean so if it says that the average salesperson makes a thousand dollars at this job um, we're supposed to create a scenario that fits the information so um, let's say that they employ um, 10 people currently okay so this is we'll label this job a and this job b and this job c just to kind of keep things straight so if for job a say they have 10 people and the average is a thousand a week then we would need our total we had one thousand dollars average times 10 people we would need our total to be ten thousand dollars but that doesn't mean that everybody makes a thousand dollars maybe the first person poor guy only makes made nothing um, maybe the next gal only made five hundred dollars and so on we need a total of ten thousand but that doesn't mean that everybody makes a um, thousand dollars so say someone up here makes um, two thousand dollars and another person makes two thousand dollars and another person makes three thousand dollars well that means that there's people down here um, in the lower end that that made less than that so if we total this up with the way I have it written down right now I already have three four five six seven thousand five hundred I've only got two thousand five hundred dollars to split between all the rest of the people so say this person makes um, five hundred got another person that makes five hundred now I've got one thousand five hundred left um, one two three four five six seven then that means I'd need another in this case another three people that made five hundred dollars squeeze this in here so I have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten people if I sum this up I have one thousand two thousand three thousand four thousand five thousand six thousand seven thousand I have ten thousand total so the average of this ten thousand is what it totals and I divide that amongst the ten people and then I have my desired average of one thousand dollars each okay now does that mean that everyone made a thousand dollars no there were one two three four five six seven people that made far less than a thousand dollars but there were three people who made quite a bit more than a thousand dollars that still averages out to be a thousand dollars so keep that in mind when we go to decide which job to use and this was um, per week we also have to keep these kinds of things in mind so for B it says our company is hiring one person this month will you be that person we pay the top percentage commission and supply leads half of our sales force makes over three thousand dollars per month join the above average team now it says half of our sales force makes over three thousand dollars so if we're talking about cutting the people that work there in half we're talking about a median okay so this one had used mean whereas this one is using median so if we try to come up with a set of again 10 people where half make over three thousand dollars and that's per month so let's write that up here so if they make a thousand a week that's roughly four thousand per month up here just to compare apples to apples and um, but again that would mean say this person made five hundred dollars uh, for four weeks that would mean that they would only make two thousand total this person if they kept up that same rate they'd make twelve thousand for the month so the difference between making two thousand in a month and making twelve thousand in a month is is a significant difference 
So let's try to come up with a data set that fits for this group B description, or this job B description. Half of our sales force makes over $3,000. So, um, say one person makes uh, 3500 And then say we have three people that make 3500 one that makes $4,000, another makes $4,500. These people over here could make anything less than that. You could have a, three people that made nothing, another person that made you know, $500 for the month, another person that made $2,000 for the month. I have five people here and five people here. That fits the description of half our sales force makes over $3,000. They don't talk about the other half that didn't make over $3,000 per month. And again, this is per month. So up here, if you take the average person at this job um, makes uh, 4000 a month, here, if we were to average this, it's going to be less than $4,000 um, because these people made below $3,500 or below 3,000 and these people made above 3,000 but the average here is going to be less for the month than than here because again $500 a week would be 2,000 a month 2,000 a month 2,000 a month 2,000 2,000 2,000 this person if you take that times four weeks in a month that'd be 8,000 8,000 12,000 so this job seems to have the opportunity from what the description is to possibly make more on average than this job. Again, it's, it's kind of hard to know because of the, the cryptic way that they say it. Um, now it says, join a super sales force and make as much as you want. Five of our nine salespeople each closed four homes last month and their average commission was 1500 per sale. Do the math. This is the job for you. So again, we're going to try to come up with some data that fits that. So um, now they only have nine people, but um, because it says four of our five of our nine, but those five closed four homes with an average commission of fifteen hundred dollars. Well, if you close four homes at fifteen hundred dollars, that's six thousand dollars. So they're saying that there are five people at this job that made an average of six thousand dollars again this doesn't necessarily mean they all made six thousand but that'd be the easiest way to to write it down but you could have someone that um you know only made five thousand or four thousand and then another person that made up for that or, or spread out among different people but again that doesn't mean that there weren't people that made nothing you know maybe the other four people that work here made these kinds of salaries for the month you know, maybe they closed on one home and had a a thousand dollar commission. Maybe they closed on one home and had twelve uh, fifteen hundred. Maybe this person closed on two homes, but they each were only a thousand dollars. So again, if we're looking at this um, in comparison, you know, it says which job would you expect to earn the most money? Um, actually, uh, in looking at this, I would say potentially this job could have the best um, income but it's so hard to tell this is this one seems since it's four out of five or I'm sorry five out of nine to be a li maybe a little bit more consistent um, this one says we're talking about the median you know this could be anything down here um, and anything up here um, as long as it was over 3,000 so if they're saying 3,000 is kind of their goal then that's saying that they probably don't have a lot of people that are above that. Um, this is giving $1,000 per week, um, which makes it sound, when you see the 1000 it makes it sound like less, but then when you're talking about that's a week and these are, in, these are months, this one may have the best potential. But again, we don't know. Um, they make things so cryptic that we're not sure um, exactly what they're saying. And by the way, this right here, they were mostly talking about the mode because they were talking about these people that made the most but we also talked about average because it was the an average commission of fifteen hundred dollars but this was focused more on the mode because we were talking about those top five salespeople 
So the biggest thing to take away from this, um, this lesson as far as decision making is when you're looking at and comparing things, you have to make sure that you're looking at the details. You know, the, the fact that they're talking about different types of measurement here, mean, median, and mode, that they're talking about different time periods, weeks versus months. Um, this is the kind of things, whether you're deciding on what job you want to um, try to get or you're trying to decide what apartment you want to get, trying to decide what school you want to go to based on cost. Um, you have to look at all these little details because at face value, sometimes something looks much better um, than another option, but there's a detail that you're not looking at. So here, when you see this 3,000, that kind of pops out at you. But in reality, the way I have it written out, this job could be the least pain. So um, you have to look for those details when you're trying to make decisions about where you're going to spend your money or um, the decisions that you're going to make. So our, la our last uh, section for the week, uh, Lesson 6D, um, we're going to talk about, we're still on this theme of personal finance, and now we're going to talk about what are called box plots. Um, these actually used to be more typically called box and whisker plots, and when we make it, I'll show you why the, where the box and whisker name comes from. So it says here that this is the data from a realtor in thousands of all the homes sold one month in a small city. So this 550 is $550,000 home. 61 is the $61,000 home and so on. It says place the sale prices in order from smallest to largest and do you notice anything interesting? So I'm going to go through here. Hopefully I won't mess anything up. We've got a 50. Um, looks like 61 is next. And then we have 72. 75, uh, 279s, and I do want to write both of those down, 79, 79, um, our next is 129, oops, nope, we had 121 before that. So, let me erase that. So we had 121, and then 129. Uh, next we have a 142 and a 147. I wanted to get this all in one row, but it's not going to fit. 142 and 147. Then we have a 150. Uh, 228 and a 240. Okay, so I took the time to rewrite these because I really wanted these all in one row. Um, it says, do you notice anything interesting about the data set? So as we look at this data set, um, some different things that pop out. The lowest is 50, the highest is 240. Um, there seems to be quite a gap between uh, this data set or this data point and the next. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 homes that were under $200,000, actually $150,000 or less, and only two homes that were above that price. So we have um, and I need to get my 550 in here, sorry. So we actually have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 homes that are below, 150,000 or below, and only three that are above that. And we have this one that is definitely much, much higher than all the rest. So we have this 550, and we don't have anything even close to that. Um, we have two that are kind of close here, but then another, again, a kind of a break down here. These are all fairly... Uh, you know, have kind of small incremental jumps as we go. Um, if we wanted to put in, say, uh, where the median is, um, which we're going to need here in a minute anyway, let 
we had 14 total. So if we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the median is right here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I put 7 on each side. So the median is between the 121 and the 129. Um, that actually comes out to be 125 for the median. So 125,000 is the median um, of the price of the homes. So now we're going to continue with what we call the five number summary. And the five number summary, the first thing we need is the median, which was that 125,000. And actually, you can do these in any order, but that, we already have that, so we'll write that down. The smallest number in the set is going to be, of course, the 50. So the smallest number in the set is 50,000. Um, the largest is going to be the 550. And then the median of the lower half, which is called Q1. Q stands for quartile. So right now we've got this split in halves. Now we want to split it into quarters. And so we're going to go to the bottom half here, and we're going to split it again, just like when you're, you know, when you're making, when you're cutting up a, a pizza, say. You cut it in half, then you cut it in half again. That's not very well centered, but that's supposed to be equal there. But um, we've cut it in half right now. Now we're going to cut it in half again. So what's half of these bottom seven numbers? Well, that would be the 75 right here because there's an odd number, so 75 falls right in the middle. So Q1 here would be $75,000. And then Q3 would be the middle of this upper half, which would be this 150 right here. So $150,000. Now, why do they call them quartiles? Again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to split this kind of in quarters. So we're saying a fourth of the data falls here, then the next fourth of the data falls here, then the next fourth here, and the next fourth here. This median can actually be called quartile two, but it's kind of like in a sports game. If you think about a football game, um, at the end of the first quarter, we say it's the end of the first quarter. At the end of the second quarter, we could say it's the end of the second quarter, but what we typically say is we're at halftime. So median is kind of like halftime. Um, then we come back and we go to the end of the third quarter and then we have the end of the game would be that maximum value. So now we're going to actually create um, what's known as a box plot. So this 125,000 that's in the middle, we're going to mark on here um, where that would be. So there's 125,000 right there. We're going to also mark the um, 75, the 150. So the 75 would be here and the 150 would be here. So again, that's the Q1 and the Q3. And then we mark the upper and the lower. So they've already got the, the lower marked for us, and the upper would be way up here. So that's what you want to start with when you're making your box plot. Um, and then what we do is we actually literally box in the middle of the data. So 50% of the data fell between 75,000 and 150,000. That would be you know, from here to here. And that's the part that we box in. The part that's in the upper quarter and the lower quarter, the first quarter and the last quarter, we make a little line from that box out to where that's at. And so now you can kind of see maybe why this used to be often called a box and whisker Plot. So these sort of look like whiskers on the end of your box. But within this box plot, this is one-fourth of the data. This is one-fourth of the data. This is the next one-fourth, and this is the final one-fourth. So this box plot splits the data up into four parts. Um, this would be your median. This would be below the median. This would be above the median. This would be, again, the next quarter past the median, and this would be the quarter past that. So when you see box and whisker plots, when you see something really wide like this, whether it be part of the box or it be the whisker, you know the data up here is very spread out. 
which is what we had already noticed. From this Q3 up to the maximum value, there was quite a gap from 150 to 550, and that's represented on this graph by this big long whisker on the end. Um, let me write in here that this was Q3, that this was Q1, that this was the max, and that this was the min. So on the graph, this was the min, this was the max, this right here is the Q3, this is the Q1, and this is the median. Okay. So now let's go down here and answer the questions that they ask us about this data. It says, how many of the data values are at or below the median? Um, what percent of the total number of values does this represent? So how many? There were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So there were 7 that were at or below the median. This was the median, remember. What percent of the total uh, number does this represent? Well, that's 50%. 50% were at or below the median. That's the definition of what the median is. How many of the data values are below Q1? So there's three that are below Q1. Um, there's three that are above, and Q1 actually can, is one of our actual numbers. So um, at or below Q1, there's actually um, four, if we count the 75. And what percent does that represent? Well, it's not exactly 25%, but it's as close as we could get because it fell right on this value. So you could think of... You know, the 75 is sort of being shared, so it's sort of like 3.5 and 3.5. And um, but I want to make sure we say 25% because that's what the, the quartiles are supposed to be doing. Same thing here. What values are at or above Q3? Well, we have 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's supposed to represent about 25% of the data. It's a little bit more because the 150 um, can't be counted on both sides. But if you kind of think of it as 3.5 above and 3.5 below, um, then it's 25% of the data. How many of the data values range from Q1 to Q3? So we have Q1 itself, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that are at, uh, from Q1 to Q3. What does this represent for the total? Again, it's not exactly 50%. 50% would be, would be 7, but we still sort of think of that from quartile 1 to quartile 3 as being about 50%. I'm going to put some approximately equal symbols here. Last, it, or next it says find the mean of the data values to the nearest dollar. And um, so if we were to go up here, that means that we're going to have to add all these numbers up. So I added all these numbers up, and for a total, I got... Um, 2,123, but remember that's in thousands, so it's actually 2,123,000 dollars total. So 2,123,000, I think I said that wrong. Um, total sales is what all these houses um, combined sales price was. There were 14 of those houses, and so we get an average of, and I'm going to have to round this, so we get an average of about 151643. So an average sales price of about $151,643. Um, so if we were going to use this information to write a short news report, we could bring in any of this data that we wanted. We could say the median house sales in town was $125,000. You could say the average sales were $151,000 or over $151,000. You could say the highest price house sold for $550,000. You could say the least price home sold for fifty, dollars And it kind of depends on your angle. If you're trying to convince someone that this is uh, somewhere that's reasonably priced to live, you might mention the median of $125,000 and the minimum of fifty. dollars If you were talking about how great um, of prices you could get if you sold your house in this town, you might mention the average of over 150000 with the highest sale of 550000 So it kind of depends on how you want to spin this. Um, and you could even talk about quartiles. You could say, you know, um, 
a fourth of the house is sold for over a hundred and fifty thousand um, a fourth of the house is sold for uh, seventy five thousand or less so there's all kinds of different things you could say it just kind of depends on what you're how you're trying to spin it and so that concludes our unit six and um, hopefully you you've been successful with the homework and remember we're um, going to be coming up uh, soon here to um, a test day um, when we get done with unit eight we're going to be having a test that next week and so I'll be posting up some information about that as we go but um, for right now uh, hopefully this helps you with unit um, six and um, we'll see everybody back for unit seven